Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you again for the great talk. Um, our next speaker is Brian Fails. Um, without any further ado, uh, floor is yours, Brian. Thanks. Can we see it? I'm assuming people can see my screen? Yes. OK, great. So good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Scott Fails. I'm a postdoc at uh, Stanford University and Todd Martinez's group. Today, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to give you kind of a case study uh, approach to this. So I'm going to talk about spin purity in wave functions in the context of non-adiabatic molecular dynamics. So to motivate the discussion today, I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about simulating non-adiabatic molecular dynamics. Now, a lot of our effort as electronic structure theory practitioners is typically focused on solving a time-independent Schrodinger equation. Now, one of the main approximations that we make is to separate the motion of the nuclei from the motion of the electrons. Now, most of the time we can get away with this because, so A, the nuclei are much more massive than the electrons are, and B, the electrons move a lot faster than the nuclei do. So in other words, the, the motion of the nuclei is uncoupled from the motion of the electrons. Now, the separation is known as the Born-Offenheimer approximation. By explicitly uncoupling the nuclear and the electronic motion, we can obtain a useful picture where the nuclei move around on a potential energy surface that's determined by the electrons. Now, the simplest case we can consider is a homonuclear dimer. And so you can see here that by varying the inner nuclear separation, this produces this familiar potential energy curve, which I'm showing here. And so each electronic state has its own unique curve or surface. And when each of these states is well resolved in energy, this so-called adiabatic picture remains valid. Now, however, if the states become degenerate in energy, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation begins to fall apart. Now, the coupling between the electrons and the nuclei, which we completely neglect in the adiabatic picture, becomes extremely large in these cases. Now, we can visualize the, uh, this intersection by constructing a potential surface where we vary the degrees of freedom that happen to break this degeneracy. And the resulting surfaces here form a diabola. So you have essentially these inverted cones that touch each other at a single surface or in this case, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional seam. And so the seam of degeneracy here is known as the conical intersection. Oh, sorry. And so we're gonna talk here for a few minutes about uh, single determinant theory. And so in particular, we're gonna focus on uh, the hartree fock or the Cohen-Sham DMT approach. Uh, yeah, so this provides us with the mean field description of the wave function. And so you can imagine here looking at ethylene, and so we're well resolved at the equilibrium geometry. And so you have doubly occupied electrons in the, highest or in the lowest occupied molecular orbital, or LUMO, and the highest occupied molecular orbital, or HOMO, is empty. However, if you twist this bond, you can see that these two orbitals can become degenerate. And so now it's not clear into which one of these orbitals you should put the electrons. And so a simple way to overcome this limitation that's set by the single determinant theory is to solve uh, a more general problem. And so here we're going to use a determinant basis instead of a single particle orbital basis. And so we can begin with our Fock determinant, and then we can include all of the other determinants that arise from the electron excitation into the single particle orbital space. And so for example, for this two electron, two orbital space, we can form four determinants. We have the hartree fock determinant shown here. We have a couple of single excitations, and then we have this doubly excited determinant here. Now solving this, the time independent Schrodinger equation in this determinate basis is an eigenvalue problem that has an exact variational solution that also gives us access to the excited states. And so this is known as the full configuration interaction or full CI method. So I'm gonna have to back out here for just a moment. I'm having some issues with my presentation, excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. And so unfortunately, full CI scales really badly. And so you can see here that the computational cost grows exponentially. And so we're not gonna talk today about how to break the scaling. So there's two approaches that you can take to gain traction on this problem. Uh, first, you can break the scaling of this problem. And we've done this in the context of uh, rank reduction. So rank reduction full CI is, is a way that you can reduce the scaling of this and push farther up the curve. The other approach that you can take is to adapt your problem to use novel technology. So in this case, we're gonna talk about using graphics cards. 
And so graphic processing units or GPUs are hardware code processors that were developed for playing video games. Now, in some cases, the, the massive parallelism that they provide can be leveraged to solve other programming tasks. Now, fortunately, many quantum chemistry programs can be written in a way that take advantage of GPU processing power. And so each GPU contains about 3,000 processing cores. Now, in comparison, most CPUs contain between 2 and 20 cores. Now, one trade-off is that the CPU cores have uh, more complex instruction sets. They operate at higher speed than the GPU cores do. The other trade-off is that the GPU cores don't operate independently. And so instead, they perform the same operation across large batches of data. Now, the advantage of keeping a large number of processing units in close proximity to one another is evident by looking at the time evolution of GPU versus CPU performance. And so you can see here that GPUs have continued to improve uh, in, in their, their flop performance, whereas CPU performance has relatively flatlined in the last 20 years. And so I'm excited to point out the use of parallel hardware architectures continues to gain traction in the theoretical chemistry community. And so this is especially important as new supercomputers coming online tend to provide at least some support for parallel code processors. So both Jeff Hammond, who spoke this morning, and then Ed Vileyev, who you just heard from, have been pushing out advancing couple cluster methods via GPU acceleration. Another very recent development is the presentation of this high performance SCF implementation in games, which I'm showing the, uh, the talk graphic here. And so for reference, here's a comparison of the GPU accelerated TerraChem and the CPU accelerated game from about 12 years ago. And so the speed ups range from about 10x to 175x uh, TerraChem over game, depending on the size of the molecular system. However, by rethinking and then moving their algorithms from the CPU to the GPU, games not only closed the gap between the two codes, but in fact surpassed TerraCAM by moving uh, many of their linear algebra operations in involved in the dice solve to the GPU as well. And so both Ed Hohenstein and myself have been recently working on both standard and rank reduced couple cluster and full CI GPU implementations. Now today I'm going to focus on the full CI stuff, so we'll be talking about couple cluster. And so first, I'm going to give you an overview of the method and its parallel implementation. And then I'm going to shift gears and talk about some stability issues that are related to both floating point precision and electronic spin. All right. And so the first task that we're going to perform with the full CI program is that we have to affect the integral transformation from the atomic orbital to the molecular orbital basis. Now, the reason that we do this is because the MO basis is significantly more sparse. And so we can leverage the sparsity to uh, makes solving the Hamiltonian much faster. And so the way that we accomplish this, and so, so, so naively, if you perform this uh, operation, this ends up being n to the eighth in scaling. Uh, if you play a trick that you often play um, to break scaling, you can trade storage for flops. And so you can get this down to n to the fifth over four if you take advantage of symmetry and a lot of storage. However, we took a different approach here. Our approach actually scales around n to the sixth uh, in principle, and we do this by doing a bunch of uh, Coulomb matrix constructions. And so this is a very efficient operation done on the GPU. We also leverage the fact that these Coulomb matrix operations take advantage of Schwarzbaum screening. So instead of being uh, quartic in scaling, these Coulomb matrix operations are closer to quadratic. So something between 1.7 and 2.3 is the, the scaling factor. And so the other uh, dimensions here are going to be the MO basis dimensions, and so our active spaces for full CI tend to be relatively small. And so this allows us to actually keep our scaling for this transformation to around quadratic, which allows us to do full CI integral transformations for proteins. And so I'm showing here sometimes, uh, this is from 2015, so this is done on a single K40 GPU. And you can see here, we're looking at three di different active spaces. We have six electrons and six orbitals, which is only about 400 determinants. We have 12 electrons and 12 orbitals, which is just under a million determinants. And then we have 16 electrons and 16 orbitals, which is 165 million. And so you can see here, looking at five different systems, you have some you know, pyrazine, and then you've got some uh, uh, graphitic carbon nitride system, you have a buckyball, and then finally you've got the silicon cluster. Now the points in this box here correspond to points that you could in principle compute on uh, a CPU at the time. Uh, it took about 10 times as long uh, comparing uh, a Xeon CPU with four cores to a single K40 GPU. The points that are outside of the box correspond to cases where uh, you, weren't on, you weren't able to do this without a GPU. And so in fact, you can see here that for this largest silicon cluster, we're able to do the integral transformation in only a few minutes. 
All right, so the second challenge lies in solving the CI eigenvalue problem. Now, solving this eigenvalue problem is equivalent to diagonalizing the Hamiltonian matrix. Now, if we were to completely diagonalize this matrix, this computational cost would be cubic, where n is on, on the order of the number of state determinants. And so, of course, this number n is enormous. It's combinatorial with respect to the number of electrons and the number of orbitals. Now, fortunately, we're only interested usually in a few of the lowest lying eigenvalues. Now, what this means is that we can take advantage of lower scaling iterative diagonalizers. And so typically our diagonalizer of choice for these problems is Davidson's approach. Now, these iterative approaches often rely on a matrix vector product between the Hamiltonian matrix and a trial vector. Now, what this means is that you never have to actually construct and store the full Hamiltonian, and instead you focus on forming this so-called sigma vector, which I've shown here. Now, the CI Hamiltonian is comprised of both one electron terms on the left, and then the two electron terms shown here on the right, and, and the green and the blue circles. The two electron terms are much more expensive than the one electron term, so we're going to focus on their uh, evaluation today. Now, as I just mentioned, it's often the case that you can break the scaling of an algorithm by reusing some of the intermediate results. And so essentially, you're trading storage for flops. Now, the Knowles and Handy algorithm, which I outlined here, does exactly this. And so you've refactored the two electron terms into three discrete steps. And so by redundantly storing intermediate data in these D and these E matrices, and here the uh, definitions for the matrix element are shown, we're able to simultaneously reorder the data in memory to facilitate efficient access, which is really important on the graphics cards. And then also we're able to cast this rate limiting step shown here in the middle in the form of a single matrix matrix multiplication. Now this is particularly important for parallel hardware such as graphics cards, and this is because matrix multiplications are usually uh, performed extremely efficiently. This is particularly true with the, uh, the, new, the newer Volta card and the Ampere card where you can actually leverage the uh, tensor cores. All right, and so this is kind of a quick breakdown of what the algorithm looks like. And so you have this central matrix matrix multiplication. You have the D matrix on the right, the E matrix on the left. These are your transformed electron repulsion integrals, I, J, K, and L. The GPU kernels are shown above and below. And so this corresponds to the uh, expression where you're forming D. And then you have similar kernels down here where you're forming uh, sigma. Now, in each one of these cases, you're doing a bunch of operations on some data that's strided in memory. And so for the alpha alpha terms, you can see here that you're actually contiguous in memory in a lot of cases, but you have to kind of stride through memory. So this term is really, really easy to do. The beta terms are a lot more complicated. And so these terms are challenging because not only are you jumping through memory, but now you're strided. And so these terms required uh, considering the latency of moving the data back and forth and you have to interleave the, the, the kernel evaluation. The sigma operations where you're taking the result from the E matrix and you're scattering it back out to the final sigma vector have a very similar form with the single difference being now that you have to worry about your accumulations being atomic operations. Now, when we first implemented this, we didn't have access to hardware atomics and double precision. So we had to use compare and swap approaches. Uh, anything past CUDA 6 now has uh, hardware support for um, atomics. And so the full CI calculation on a single K40 card for the silicon nanocluster. So this is like a 1.7 uh, nanometer cluster. Uh, 72 silicons, 16 electrons, 16 orbital active space, so pretty big. Uh, and it took 39 minutes. And so this is 39 minutes, not on a supercomputer, but this was done on a desktop, right? So this is a single GPU sitting in a desktop under the desk. Now, so this was good, but the most straightforward path to improving the computation performance further was to try to adapt this algorithm for use with multiple GPU devices. Now, fortunately, the core GPU kernels, which I've already shown you, required only minor modification. Although we had to perform significant pre and post processing of the trial vector shown on the top and the sigma vector shown at the bottom here. And so essentially what we had to do is you went through and you grabbed all of the um, non-zero parts of memory that you wanted to use. You had to pack them into dense structures. It turns out in this case that it was advantageous to actually transpose the entire trial vector. So we had two versions of it in memory and this resulted in a pretty dramatic speed up. Now to benchmark the performance of this multi-GPU algorithm, we computed the, the CI wave function for ethylene using the same 16 electron in orbital space. Now the CPU times for a very good uh, CPU based full CI program are shown in orange and the GPU times are shown in blue here. And so you can see here that by the time you get to 
165 million determinants. And we've since then pushed to over a billion determinants. You're just starting to uh, climb this exponential wall, whereas with the CPU, the prefactor is much, much higher. And so if we plot the relative speed depth between the two calculations, this gives you an alternative perspective. For the full CI, full CI program, the GPU implementation has a significant advantage. So in some cases, you have better than 100x speed up. Now, so not only that, it can like the dynamic simulations to go back to our primary motivation, often require description of several electronic states simultaneously. Now, it's not uncommon for us to want three to five electronic states or even more for a given trajectory. Now, as we began to use this full CI program in the context of these MD simulations, we noticed an unacceptable rate of failure, and it was due to wave function, wave function conversion problems. Now, we noticed that this problem was especially pronounced in open shell molecular systems. Now, we were able to reproduce these convergence failures by calculating the CI wave function of this ethylene anion. And so we correlated 11 electrons and 11 orbitals, and then we attempted to compute the lowest 20 doublet states. Now, for reference, the target spin expectation for this system should be 0 0.75, which I'm showing here is this blue line. And so we track the spin expectation of the trial vector at several points during the iterative diagonalization procedure at each iteration. And so we looked at the spin of the residual vector, the spin after preconditioning the residual vector, we looked after orthogonalizing this thing, and then we also looked at the sigma vector. And so that the sigma vector, after you apply the Hamiltonian to it, would really amplify any spin contamination that was present. And so this plot here depicts the, the spin expectation of one particular root as a function of the iteration. Now we found that the wave function didn't preserve spin symmetry as we expected it to, and instead it resulted in convergence in this case to one of our untargeted quartet states. And so it turns out this is a pretty well studied problem, although after 40 years it was still unsolved. And so what people were trying to do is they spent a lot of time and effort developing ways of improving determinable CI convergence. Now, several of these efforts are uh, outlined in this paper here by uh, Leninger in 2001. And they systematically investigated a variety of diagonalization and preconditioning approaches. Now, unfortunately, when we implemented and we tested uh, all of these approaches, we did not observe any significant improvement over the convergence behavior for some of these challenging cases that we encountered. Now, the fundamental problem is that the state of determinate basis spans the full spin subspace. Now, we can project out each spin manifold of the full space in a Hamiltonian. You can think about your full Hamiltonian as different spin blocks. You might have a double block and a quartet block and a sextet block in this case. And so normally in a determinate basis, if you use guest vectors that are spin eigenfunctions and they have the correct target spin expectation, that usually results in well-behaved solution of the wave function. So basically, if you start out with a doublet, you remain in the doublet space. However, the accumulation of numerical error can cause the solver to wander into the wrong spin subspace. And so this is particularly prevalent when you're using parallel programs because you're non-deterministic then when you're doing some of your, your uh, matrix operations. And so in this case, accumulation of numerical error caused our solver to wander into the wrong spin subspace. And so the primary cause of this, of course, is that numerical noise is occurring because our floating point representation in digital computers is not exact. And so we're going to revisit here what we're looking at in terms of the spin eigenfunction. So here's our definition for S squared. And you can think about this in terms of determinants. And so you've got four different determinants here. Two of these are spin eigenfunctions, and then two of them are not. So the closed shell ones where you have W occupied uh, orbital zero and W occupied orbital one are both spin eigenfunctions. These are singlets. These open shell guys are not spin eigenfunctions. And so then to form spin eigenfunctions with them, you need to take linear combinations of these open shells. And so for the singlet, you get this third spin eigenfunction, which is the positive. And then for the, the negative variant, you've got the triplet. So then you can go back and you might ask why we use the curvatus to begin with. And so there are significant algorithmic advantages to forming the sigma vector in a determinate basis. So it'd be kind of foolish to go back and actually rewrite our, our algorithms to use CSF, even though they do converge better. So in this case, the coupling coefficients and determinants are integers. Not only are they integers, but they're plus one, minus one, and zero. They're really straightforward. And then rather than floating point numbers, the, so then the wave function can be conveniently factorized as an outer product of the alpha and the beta strings or the occupancy patterns. Now, the disadvantages of this approach are that the determinant basis is significantly larger than the CSF basis. And as we've already seen, we can run into convergence problems. 
So as a result, the way that we targeted this problem is we decided to pursue a hybrid approach. And so the idea here is that we were going to do the sigma formation to determinants, and then we were going to transform to CSF through our diagonalization, and then transform back to determinants of the next iteration. Now, the idea here is that we can take advantage of the best of both worlds. Uh, so we get the good diagonalization in CSF, so we get the very fast sigma builds, but that means we have to have a, like a blazing fast transformation between the two basis sets. And so this is the problem that we're trying to solve. And so you can look at this problem very naively and say, how in the world do we do this, uh, this transformation? And it's really just a matrix vector multiply, but it's a huge matrix. So it's the number of CSF times the number of determinants. And so this is combinatorial in both dimensions. And so what this does is it informs our preferred strategy. So we'd like to leverage sparsity in the transformation matrix of which there's quite a bit. So less than one tenth of 1% of these elements are non-zero. And then we wanna perform the matrix vector multiplication directly. So we never form the matrix. And then we make it all really fast using graphics cards. So each CSF is comprised of one or more determinants and each determinant contributes to one or more CSFs. And so we saw this a couple of slides ago. The determinants in the CSFs are connected by coupling coefficients that form the matrix elements of the transformation matrix. Now these coupling coefficients are computed by examining the overlap between each CSF and determinant as you add the unpaired electrons one at a time. So this is the genealogical coupling approach. Now these overlaps are constructed by taking the products of the klebs gordon coefficients, which I'm defining here. So I'm showing you this to demonstrate the computational complexity that's associated with constructing these matrix elements. However, by organizing the work in terms of the unpaired electrons or seniority blocks, we're able to reuse all of these computed quantities, which reduces our overall effort dramatically. And so with our strategy to solve the computational scaling problem in hand, the next challenge was to connect the lexically ordered determinant basis and the spin block ordered CSF basis. Now we accomplished this by introducing spin ordered determinant basis. And so that's this intermediate basis shown here. And so with this intermediate basis, we can generate this index based hash to connect our CSF basis, which we represent as a, a three tensor into our lexically ordered slate determinant basis where you have outer products of alpha and beta strings. And so putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, we formulated the graphics card accelerated CI basis transform algorithm. Now the performance of the full CI program here was gonna depend strongly on the ratio between this transformation time and the rate limiting step, which is the signal formation time. Now this table here shows some timings for the basis transformation times. So this is CSF to depths on the left. We have the terminus to CSF in the middle here. And then on the right, we have sigma vector formation. So all these times are shown in seconds. And then we're looking at three different active spaces. So we're looking at well, what I consider to be a small active space, which is 12 electrons and 12 orbitals. We have 14 electrons and 14 orbitals as kind of intermediate regime. And then 16 electrons with 16 orbitals is starting to get pretty large. And so in every one of these cases, we observe that the basis transformation is between combined, they're between 15 and 20 times faster than the signal formation. And so it's informative to see how each CI basis, the slate determinant basis and the hybrid basis performs in a real world application. So we're gonna return to the ethylene calculation. We're gonna look at four states. So we're looking at four singlet states of 16 electrons, 16 orbital active space. And so the residual norm here shown on the left tells us our progress for convergence. And then we're looking at the number of iterations. And so unsurprisingly, the determinant basis calculation can converge very poorly. It requires 32 iterations to converge and the worst case scenario occurs and we ultimately converge this orange state here to a triplet. Now the CSF basis calculation does a lot better. So you can see here that we converge in 20 iterations. More importantly, we get all the right spin states. And so we can examine the total time for each one of these CI calculations. And then we can break down the timings for each iteration in terms of the different steps. So the CSF basis shown on the left, the slate of the determinant basis shown on the right. Total times are shown on the top here. So we have 956 seconds for the total time in the hybrid basis. In the determinant basis, we have almost 2,400 seconds. And so what's surprising here is the CSF basis is approximately twice as fast as the slate of the determinant basis, even though we're performing extra work. And so you can understand this by looking at the integrated area between the orange curves which is the total time per iteration, and the blue curve, which is the sigma vector time. And so you can see here for the CSF basis, this is a relatively small amount, whereas in the determinant basis, this is a pretty large integrated area. 
And so we see that the trend here is that we spend a lot of time doing non-sigma related work in our study of the current basis. And so the answer to this question of why is this occurring is that by using graphics cards for the rate limiting step, which is traditionally sigma vector formation. So this thing scales linear, linearly with slated determinants and then quarterly with the number of orbitals in the active space, we start to see different bottlenecks emerge. And so much of the unaccounted for times so that large integrated area in the determinant basis calculation comes from orthogonalization of the trial vector. So every time we add a new trial vector to the search space, we end up having to orthogonalize it to the rest of the set. And so we do this with essentially a bunch of gem Vs. And so these vectors represent the introduction of new wave function iteration, information with every uh, iteration that we uh, enter. And so the inner product calculations that comprise these gram schmidt orthogonalization operations do have lower scaling than single formation, right? They're just uh, linear with theta determinants. You don't have this orbital term. But we're doing them on the CPU. And so we ignore them typically because they are lower scaling, but we can't afford to put these on the GPU. So the problem is that the, the memory space for these trial vectors is huge. So it's 10 times the uh, size of the total subspace is the, the full subspace size. And so it's that number of uh, sigma vectors and trial vectors that you need to keep in core memory or you need to swap them back out to disk. And so there's some technical problems here. Obviously, the graphics cards have much less physical memory than the host does. So even the newest uh, the A100 cards have some like 80 gigabytes of memory. We easily have 1.5 petabytes in some of our compute nodes. And so the alternative approach here um, is you can try to shuttle the data back and forth from the, the CPU to the graphics card, do the, the linear algebra on the graphics card, and then transfer the results back to the CPU. However, you, you hit a second challenge here, and that's even with the Power9 architecture where you have much faster transfer rates, it's still pretty expensive to move data from the CPU host to the GPU and back. And so because you can't avoid this transfer in this case, any gains that you perform or that you achieve by performing the compute on the graphics card get immediately washed out by the CPU GPU uh, intercommunication. And so these points, when you take them together, imply that orthogonalization is best performed using the CPU. So as a result, the natural thing that you want to try to do is reduce the amount of work that you're performing. And so in this case, by performing diagonalization in the CSF basis, the CI vectors become significantly shorter. And so there's a table here that demonstrates the number of determinants for three different active spaces. So we're looking at 14 electrons, 16 electrons, and 18 electrons. And we're looking at the number of singlet and triplet CSFs for each one of these cases. In parentheses, I'm showing the reduction in size relative to the number of slated determinants for each case. And so you can see here that the CSF basis vectors are somewhere between two and five times smaller than the determinant basis. Now, importantly, as the size of the CI basis increases, the CSF basis vector becomes proportionally shorter relative to the slate of the term. And so these shorter CSF basis vectors directly translate to spending a lot less time doing the linear algebra. And so when we started this, wor this work, the goal was to make this transformation between the two basis sets as small as possible, knowing that we were going to incur some additional computational cost because we were doing extra work. Now, our primary concern was improving convergence properties. And so we expected we had to pay some upfront price in terms of the, of the time cost in doing so. So instead, you can see that we get to have our cake and eat it too here. So not only is convergence significantly better in the CSF basis, but we've cut the total time to compute the CI wave function in half. And so there's a couple takeaways here. And so in some cases, the graphics card can provide significant advantages over traditional processing units. And so this is, not, this is definitely not always true. Uh, for some specific problems, we found that full CI and a couple cluster are two cases where this is definitely true. In addition, you need to step back and consider the whole problem holistically. So you need to think about your algorithm from scratch and, and build things from the ground up. So if you try to go in and just port a program naively, you're likely to get uh, you know, relatively modest speed ups. So 2x, 3x, 5x, you're not going to see the, the dramatic 100x speed ups that you might hope to see. And then finally, optimization is an iterative process. So you got to go back and forth. Um, and then sometimes you end up finding that the scaling and the parallelizability can have very complex interactions and you can get lucky. And so in our case, we got lucky and we found up, we wound up finding some extra time in some unexpected places here. And so I want to thank my uh, PhD advisor, Ben Levine, for turning me on to the CI uh, project to begin with, and then Todd Martinez for giving me the space to, 
um, work on some of the convergence problems and start to shift towards working on problems and dynamics. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, are there any questions? I have a quick question. Uh, so you mentioned there is uh, numerical instability in full CI calculations that can uh, be also due to some non-deterministic calculations. Mm -hmm. I was wondering the source of that, why, why it is non-deterministic. So anytime that you do anything in parallel, the, the, the result is not deterministic anymore, right? So if you accumulate a bunch of numbers and you have a wide range, then you might have variants of the numbers and you know, maybe the 10 or 12 decimal places. So Gil Knizia had a paper several years ago that talks about this specifically. Um, and so the challenge here, so most of the time it's okay for the terminal CI pro, uh, problem. If you start with a spin pure guess, if it's a relatively small active space and if you're using a CPU, it's usually okay. However, if you start to look at very large active spaces, open shells are particularly challenging. Um, and then when you use graphics cards, it gets really, really difficult. Um, to verify this, I looked at several other codes and I did see this problem in every other code that I looked at. So you can push not even that hard on the codes and you can get the wrong spin states come out. And the worst cases, they're not even labeled. So it'll tell you you're getting a double, but you're actually getting a quartet. Um, I think the, the code that actually performs the best is MolPro. MolPro does something very clever in that they solve the, the full CI program, a problem in a subspace, in a CSF subspace. And then they treat the, the larger part of the program um, iteratively in some kind of a perturbative fashion. The problem there is if you don't have the P space or the primary space set large enough initially, then you might miss states. 